Thank you. And this is Massachusetts. We're very excited to, to speak to you. Um, we will introduce ourselves and then ask you to introduce yourself and then we will begin. So my name is Darcy Kern. I am a professor of history at Southern Connecticut State University, just south of you. Um, and I am an alumna of the program. I competed in this many years ago and I learned a tremendous amount and really enjoyed it. So we're looking forward to hearing what you have learned. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam Mamarsadegi. I participated in this program the first year it was offered on the bicentennial of the US Constitution a long time ago. And I'm originally from Iran and over the last 10 years or so have adapted and translated a lot of this uh, Center for Civic Education curriculum for an Iranian audience. I wish you the best today. And good morning, everybody. My name is Christopher Riano. I am a professor of constitutional law and government at Columbia University and also in the assistant counsel to the governor here in the state of New York. Could you guys introduce yourselves, please? And your teacher. Good morning. My name is Kylie Karachak, and we're all juniors at East Hampton High School. Hi, my name is Chelsea Indyk. Hi, I'm Josh Damworth. I don't know where Miles Where's is. Miles? He's not here. So, <laughs> is he in the waiting room, Ryan? Yeah, something happened. He yeah. must have gotten booted. He's back in. Great. We just introduced ourselves, Miles. You can go ahead. Hello, my name is Miles Ellsworth, I'm a junior. Um, I'm sorry about that. My internet went out randomly. We can't hear you. And your teacher? Oh, and this is our wonderful teacher, Ms. Kelly Brown, and our mentor, Hannah Wazinski. Great. Good, Miles. So, um, we are going to ask you question three. And I will read the question and then ask you to give us your, um, your statement. So. Aristotle asserts in politics that it is not the form of government, the rule by the one, the few, or the many that matters most, but rather the ends of government that are most important. Where in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution did the framers set forth the ends of government? How did the framers differ, if at all, about how the ends of government should be prioritized? Which of the ends of government set forth in the Declaration and Constitution appear to have the highest priority today. You may begin. In Talos, Aristotle asserted that the goal of humans is happiness, which can only be achieved through virtue. Therefore, governments must promote virtue through laws and education. Quote, the lawgivers make the citizens good by inculcating good habits in them. And this is the aim of every lawgiver. If he does not succeed in doing that, then his legislation is a failure, unquote. The framers believe that both Aristotelian virtue and individual liberty that came out of the Protestant Reformation and Enlightenment were essential to human happiness. Therefore, the framers ingrain virtue and the protection of natural rights in the Declaration. The preamble states that to affect safety and happiness, governments must protect inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that governments derive their power from consent. It is followed by a list of grievances that were focused on the abuse of governors and their restrictions on the general assemblies. The denial of self-government and natural rights forced the colonists to abandon the social contract because the ultimate goal of government became unachievable. Both virtue and rights are central in the preamble of the Constitution. The framers declared, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty as the goals of the Constitution. The protection of virtue and rights was expanded with the Bill of Rights, specifically the First Amendment. Classical Republican ideas to promote the common good can be shown in Article 1, Section 8 through the taxation and control of military clauses. Classical Republicanism is also promoted with Articles 4 and 6, which provide for a Republican government close to the people through federalism, as well as the Fifth Amendment, which states that people's private property can be taken away for the common good of society. While the framers agreed that human happiness was the goal of government, they disagreed about how happiness was best achieved. John Adams emphasized virtue and safety, while Patrick Henry emphasized the protection of individual rights. Madison, Hamilton, and Washington were concerned with economic rights, as seen in Article 1, Section 10, which directly targeted states like Rhode Island that had violated contract rights and provided debt relief at the expense of the wealthy. Adams and Thoughts on Government explained that government should promote moral and civic education, drawing on classical Republican ideas from Cicero and Aristotle. 
Today, our courts seem more focused on expanding natural rights than classical republicanism. Using incorporation, the Warren Court began a revolution in individual due process rights, with cases like Gideon v. Wainwright leading to cases today, like McDonald v. Chicago and U.S. v. Jones. State courts also play a key role in expanding natural rights, with cases like Goodrich v. DPH, which was later implemented on a national scale with the Bergefell v. Hodges. More often, legislatures focus on promoting the common good to promote human happiness. The Affordable Care Act extended health insurance to millions of Americans. The Brady Handgun Act was created for the common safety and security while limiting some fundamental liberties. State governments with police powers focus most often on the general welfare and safety. In a national emergency, the government often prioritizes safety and the common good. For example, during the current COVID-19 outbreak, government actions to shut down non-essential businesses, close schools, and shelter in place protect the common health and therefore happiness of society. However, when there is no national emergency, the government often fails to cooperate and therefore fails to prioritize the common good. In 2014, Congress failed to pass the Immigration and Modernization Act, hurting the common good of society. In politics, Aristotle argued that successful constitutions, regardless of structure, need good laws and moral education to guide humans towards virtue and happiness. The framers believed that both Aristotelian virtue and individual liberty were essential to human happiness. We believe that the Massachusetts Civics Law is leading the way to help youth understand the role that governments must play in protecting rights and promoting virtue. We cannot just focus on one pathway to happiness, but we must seek a balance in protecting virtue, liberty, and safety. Thank you, we're ready for your questions. This is really interesting. You guys talked about happiness and virtue and moral education quite a bit. Um, there are four classical virtues that Aristotle and Cicero wrote about. Do you think we should teach those four virtues and do you think we would be a better society if we did teach those virtues in public schools? I believe that we definitely should be teaching these virtues that Cicero and Aristotle have illustrated like you mentioned. I think that classes like We the People are actually really helping to do this because it's allowing uh, our youth to become more educated in society and therefore for their future they are better like they're better to be able to participate in their government and really know what government is about. And also the framers really intended for these virtues to be taught. The, um, in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, George Mason actually mentions in section 15 the five virtues which are temperance, moderation, frugality, justice, um, and uh, moderation. And the framers actually instituted this into the actual constitution. We see the ideas of justice really being um, secured with the Bill of Rights, the second constitutional convention. And we can also see a huge focus on the justice that was lacking in the states during the articles with protections of economic liberties in article one, section 10, which directly responded to the state of Rhode Island and the idea that you can't give back, um, you can't give people um, the creditors money that isn't valueless like chickens or paper money at the time and that the government should not be involved in um, the contract rights. I understand where the colleagues are coming from but I quite frankly disagree with them. I think that when Aristotle was talking about his cultivation of ideas of cultivation of virtue and his virtue ethics theory he was stating that moral virtues you can't learn through education and you can't learn from other people forcing them on you. It has to be done through your own practice until it becomes habitual and you're able to reach the state of eudaimonia or what he considers like fulfillment, which is happiness. It's like moderation is something that you can only learn through your own doing. It's very individual. Okay, let me pick up on that. It's very individual in the sense that it's not about government. It's about the person. It's about the individual. What about the role of society? Um, so again, not government, not the laws, but society. Are we flourishing as a society and do we have enough consensus on the ends of government? Do you think we're suffering from too much polarization? Does social media tear us apart too much? What do you think about all that? Well, my I, first you can go, Josh. Okay, so uh, we have a system where we think that um, the, the end of government is happiness, but there's three ways to get to that. Those are civic virtue, security of the common good, and natural rights. I think that one way that people can uh, promote happiness is being civically virtuous. And we can see this with things like um, the voting amendments, the 15th, 19th, 24th, and 26th, which help people to get involved in government. And I really think it's people's jobs to get uh, involved in government in order to be happy. 
Uh, and uh, Adam Smith would agree with this through his ratio, uh, rational choice theory, which states that people, uh, if people have the choice um, to be virtuous or to seek immediate gratification, they will seek immediate gratification. So I think we need to teach people to be virtuous so that they can learn to be happy over time. I know you wanted to stray away from the idea of government and its role in this, but I really do think it's crucial to the lack of civil discourse that we have in today's society. This really stems from Congress and the fact that political party lines are more important than promoting laws that actually benefit the happiness of society. For example, like we talked about in our statement, the Immigration and Modernization Act wasn't passed in 2014. And we have a huge immigration problem in this country that needs to be solved with a law that would better promote happiness and the security of our nation. And the civil discourse that we're really lacking right now stems from those political parties. And George Washington warned against this in his farewell address. And he said that if we didn't have political parties, it would better benefit the happiness of our society. And we should have listened to him because now- Solutions. Thank you. What are some solutions? I think that really the way that we can get to promoting all three pillars in terms of getting hap to happiness is by taking Aristotle's idea of the golden mean and applying it to government. And we see aspects of that. So it can be done with the 1994 Law, Enfor um, Law Enforcement and Crime Prevention Act, which helped put in place common sense gun regulation, such as, a, you know, such as the assault rifles ban. We can reinstate that. It, was, it expired in 2004 with its sunset clause. We can do things like repassing that, and that will help us achieve uh, happiness because we'll be able to find a compromise between all those. Also, I think the Supreme Court has taken a huge role in promoting the happiness of society when Congress has lacked at it. So we really see this with the creation of the 14th Amendment and the Due Process Clause, which allows for substantive due process, which expands the rights of people, which therefore allows them to pursue their own happiness, as was intended in the Declaration of Independence when it stated pursue your own happiness. So by doing this with cases like Loving v. Virginia, which protects the right to interracial marriage, Griswold v. Connecticut, which protects the right of women to have contraceptive, and even Roe v. Wade, which protects the right to abortion through privacy to women, we're expanding these rights and allowing people to pursue their own happiness. Would you agree then that the incorporation and the incorporation doctrine then relates directly to happiness and then the idea of good government? A hundred percent. I think with um, cases like Chicago v. McDonald, although which does um, incorporate the right to guns, I although I think gun re regulation is crucial to having the compromise of security the common good and natural rights, I think incorporating these rights better protects them and better serves to the happiness of the people. I'm. <laughs> that worked out very well. Um, look, you guys are the first group we have had that has emphasized civic education and virtue so much. And I think that's really crucial because um, Aristotle's politics is actually his sequel to the Nicomachean Ethics. It's a moral treatise. Um, and I, one of you brought up Adam Smith too. His, his um, you know, Wealth of Nations is a sequel to his moral treatise. Um, these are moral tracks. So I'm really glad you brought that up. You guys are good. I mean, you guys are very, very good. I liked how you all worked off of each other. I liked how you gave specific examples from American jurisprudence and legislative history. Um, but I also liked how you saw the bigger picture um, in, in the Aristotelian theory. Um, I thought the emphasis, you know, you knew when I asked you the question about the civic virtues from the classical world, you knew what they were. And you, you talked about how Mason rolled them into the Virginia Declaration of Rights. I, yeah, you, this was very good. I really enjoyed listening to you guys talk. Thank you. Thank you. I also really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed how you didn't uh, only know the, the history and the philosophy and the law, but you drew on all of that knowledge and preparation, hard work to express what you think is most important to you as a citizen right now in our society. That's, that's the point of all this. Even the, the, the highest level philosophers, uh, that's at the end of the day what they were concerned about. As my colleague said, these were moral treatises. They were trying to figure out what's the right way to live, what's the best that we can do for ourselves. 
And I could see you guys today doing that. You have a genuine care. You're not just trying to say what you know and what you've read. You care about your life, your society, your fellow citizens, and you're drawing on this knowledge and preparation and the hard, hard work that your teacher has helped you to do to uh, figure out what's most important. And you have a care and concern. You have a civic virtue for your fellow citizen. That's really good to see. I know that you will value this as you go forward because it, it, you know, compared to any other unit, this, this equips you with a certain resilience in terms of mind and, and morality that you can carry through your whole life. And I really hope that you, you do always value it because you're going to learn a lot more important. You're going to continue to learn at a higher level, but this is always going to be a very foundational experience. And I just hope you never uh, underestimate how important it is. Yeah, I have to echo exactly what was just said. I'm, I mean, I can tell you the, the notes I have on my page, and I mean, I wrote down lots of examples, very, very smart. I wrote down, wow, and circled it. And so it's not even just like a bad old Batman cartoon. I mean, you guys know what you're talking about. Um, I was extremely impressed with how well you all work together. I liked the examples that you were giving me. I liked how you talked about incorporation. I don't think anybody's talked about that yet. Um, and that's after I was already impressed with you being able to name the virtues, discuss the classical texts, you tied things right back to the, uh, the old theory. And to echo what my fellow other judges said, if there's one thing that's key about unit one, um, and we actually were just talking about this offline, the three of us, if you understand these fundamentals, what changes in the way in which you can relate to social media and the way in which the world looks and operates is truly extraordinary because when you understand the basics, you can see things happen and you can understand why they happen in the system. And it's very clear to me that all of you have that ability. You all are very smart. Your answers were right on point. And just like my other fellow judges, I was very impressed. You should be very proud of yourselves today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.